Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, welcome back to the second session on the uh, online course, uh, Engineering Based Fragility and Vulnerability Assessment. Um, so let's wait a couple of minutes for more attendees, I think. Two more minutes. Start. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so, uh, in today's session, we will talk about the uh, exercise task we gave you yesterday. And hopefully, you managed to do those tasks for all three different cases of uh, buildings, school buildings. So, we will present the results. Uh, pertaining to those buildings in their original and retrofitted conditions uh, for, for each of those cases to the buildings. And then we will start the discussions. You can pose your questions or provide your feedbacks and suggestions or ask particular questions about the programs, the Excel sheets and the MATLAB programs for facility derivation. Um, thank you for joining uh, again. So I will first start with the, sorry, yep, the URM, Unreinforced Masonry Case Study. Uh, so we consider this building and um, and we asked you to analyze the outer plane walls only. The reason is uh, this building does not have a global box-like behavior. That there are no lintel bands, there is no roof band, okay? Um, for example, if you see the analysis results here, this is the pushover analysis done in the long direction. You can see the outer plane wall is the most vulnerable element in the building. That means there is no global box-like uh, behavior here. Similarly, if you load it in the transport uh, sorter direction, then you again uh, can uh, see the, the vulnerability of outer plane walls. So the st main structural deficiency here uh, is that the, the building lacks global box-like behavior, and uh, we need to strengthen it to, to increase its seismic capacity to improve its box-like behavior. So the task we gave you yesterday about this particular case is that uh, analyze the outer plane walls, get the IM versus EDP performance points. Uh, maybe you can check your results now and compare with the, the results shown here and see if, if those are matching uh, or not. And we can discuss that later. From this IM versus EAP uh, plots, uh, we used this as input uh, for facility derivation. Uh, we also gave you the damage uh, limit states, the thresholds of different damage states. So these are the facility functions with those inputs. Hope you got the, these results as well, using the MATLAB code for facility derivation. And similarly, using those facility functions and loss ratios given for 
is different damage states that we gave you yesterday in the Excel file. You managed to use the Excel function for fragility, uh, sorry, vulnerability derivation with the fragility function and the loss ratio input. So you can check your results, if these three particular results, if they are matching well or not. And if you have any questions, we'll cover those later, okay? So as I told you already, the main deficiency, structural deficiency in this building for seismic resistance is that it lacks global box-like behavior because there, is, there are no ring beams, not at lintel level, not at roof level. So the, the most efficient retrofit solution, the structural retrofit solution would be to bind all the wall elements together. We cannot insert a lintel band here because it's structurally uh, very difficult. We need to remove the beads and then insert the lintel bands. But what we can do is we can, let's say, safely remove the, the roof, then install the ring beams uh, over the walls and then reinstall the roof again. So that's a possibility uh, which is feasible. So that's the retrofit option we have adopted here. Um, and I'm going to present to you the results of uh, seismic performance assessment in terms of both the original and retrofit uh, uh, situation. So for example, here, this, this slide presents the capacity curves comparison for the original building and the retrofitted building. If you compare, so because the, the original building has different failure mechanisms for the outer plane walls and the in plane system, we have separated the results for the in plane and outer plane systems for both uh, original and retrofit cases. In original and retrofit cases, the in plane system, the retrofit does not improve the in plane system significantly, as you can expect. But in the outer plane system, the retrofitting improves the, the, the outer plane response significantly. As you can see, the, the strength uh, parameter is almost double of the uh, original building in the case of retrofitted uh, building. So based on those capacity curves and the damage stress zone, we derive the fragility functions. Here for original building, you can see there are two sets of fragility functions for the outer plane system and the implant system, because the outer plane system is the most vulnerable, as you can notice from the collapse capacity there. And for the retrofitted building, you can see the facility functions that are similar. Now, here is the comparison. For example, if you, if you see at the original, in the original building, the collapse capacity of the outer plane system is about 0.35G, that's PG, that's the maximum capacity it has uh, only only 0 0.35 bit. However, if you see the collapse capacity of the retrofitted building, it's almost 1 Z. So that's a huge uh, uh, improvement in the, in the structural capacity of the building. So the collapse capacity, we can say, generally increases by uh, 185%, almost 200% increment in the collapse capacity. Similarly, we derive the vulnerability functions as well. Original building, the red curve, retrofitted building, the green one. You can compare the uh, loss ratio, the mean damage ratio, MDR. Uh, at 50% mean damage ratio, you can see the capacity of the, the original building is 0.35G, while the capacity of the retrofitted building is about 0.7G. That's 100% uh, increment in the in the uh, in the PJ capacity for 50% loss ratio. That's a very good in improvement because of, because we, we use the uh, most efficient retrofit solution that is binding all the wall elements together to get the global box-like behavior. Now I will pass it to uh, Asana, who will present to you about this content assembly case. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so we had this case uh, of building for your hands-on task. This was a confined masonry building that, um, that is with a low design. Uh, if you have followed the previous course on glossy taxonomy, you, you are very familiar with this taxonomy system. If not, um, we can just brief that this is um, design, the 
seismic design level is decided based on a number of factors. And for confined masonry, that involves the level of confinement of walls, the level of connection between the walls and the confining elements, and also the wall density. So based on these, this building was assigned a low level of design. Um, and other parameters are as explained in this um, uh, chart on the left. So with this, we have the um, capacity curve as given the input. Uh, we then did uh, ideal idealization, which was fed into the M2 method Excel file to obtain the performance points, and then the LSM method to derive the fragility functions. So with this, um, I hope uh, your results also match. Um, we can see that uh, it has a very better, already better capacity than the um, unreinforced, unconfined masonry buildings that were presented. Uh, although we can see that it has a good capacity or in, at any maximum considered earthquake level, say for zone five of India, uh, because the buildings we, we studied were taken from a case study of school buildings from Guwahati, India. This is 0.36G. So at 0.36G, we would we, we would expect to have immediate occupancy or moderate damage, at least for the buildings to be operational immediately. So this is more than 50%. Although the collapse is unlikely uh, and it is a good thing because the confirmation is already more safer than under personal confinement. So this is the vulnerability function that is uh, obtained from the vulnerability function derivation Excel. So you can see that it has a vulnerability of more than 10%. So now is your time to set performance requirements, whether this performance is satisfactory or whether you would like to improve the performance by retrofitting or any other means. So let, let's say we want the probability of moderate damage should be within 50%. Uh, or the vulnerability should be within 10%, what would you do? So uh, there are a number of retrofit options, which we had explored slightly more in the last uh, course on GLOSI. This were some of the results that came out of a discussion we had along the course. Um, like you could have RC jacketing for columns that are really weak, um, or you could have ferrocement and GFRP overlays, which was done in real, projects um, in our own experience. Um, there are other methods as you can see here. One thing we have noticed also in the case of URM is that the building lacks global behavior. So it is a good thing that if we increase the confinement and tying of perpendicular walls together, you can expect a better behavior. So this was the building that you studied um, with, uh, uh, with low design level. This was the building that we assessed or we I showed you yesterday as a part of the example during the presentation. So this building, as you can see, it has better confining elements. It has a sill band and also a roof band on top. So you can see the difference in the numerical model as well. So these their behavior also changes under the lateral loading. This, as you can see in the URM case, we see a local out of plane collapse of these walls. While when we tie this, you get a better in-plane uh, global behavior, where the in-plane loads are taking uh, final failure, while the out-of-plane walls still stand integrated. So now when we compare the um, capacity curves, there is a good, big enough jump that can also be reflected in the um, fragility functions. Uh, like we did before in, at 0.36G, if you compare, you see a much better performance um, ensuring moderate behavior, moderate damage um, of the better building. So this can be considered as a retrofit option or a different typology, typology within confined masonry that, uh, uh, that, that is better confined. So uh, we can then evaluate the vulnerability functions where you can see the reduction in the um, vulnerability from low design to medium design. So here you can see that the, the damage ratio is uh, uh, reduced. It, it comes back, comes down from uh, about 15% to 5%. And also we, we saw in the previous figure that the moderate damage level can be, um, can be expected from this. 
So that was the case of CM. Now I leave the floor to um, Rafa to explain the RC case. Thank you. Thank you, Asana. I'm going to share my screen so it will be easier to change the slides. I think that now you can see it. Um, so yes, yeah, similarly as what Asana and Rohit already showed us, I'm going to show you the results of the RC building. The RC building, just for you to remember, is an RC tree, which means that we will have a short column behavior. It's a two rise building and um, the design level is low design level. So there are some structural deficiencies. The main one is the short column. And the second one is that once you remove the short column, you will have low lateral resistance at the at low lateral resistance in the moment resistant frames, like the stiffness of the, of the frames is not enough. So therefore the first step is to obtain the pushover curve as, as I presented here in this picture. Then from the pushover cube, you can use the Antho method as Rohit presented last um, in the last session. Uh, the first step is to obtain the idealized uh, equivalent uh, capacity curve. And with this, we can then obtain the EDPs using the Antho method as presented in here. And from the EDPs, we can use then the least square method, the one presented by Asana to obtain the set of fragility curves for each one of the damaged states with the thresholds that we uh, give to you in the, in the task. And then we can convolute or integrate those fragility functions into a vulnerability function as presented in here with some set of damage ratio per damage state. So we have in this case that for the slight damage, we will have 2% um, of the match ratio for the moderate 20, for the extensive 65, and for the collapse 100% of the total repair cost. Uh, so we will have this um, black vulnerability function. So now that we understand the vulnerability and the fragility of the original building, then we can analyze, as presented in the previous cases, how to retrofit this, this building. So as, as we know, the structural deficiencies are first the short column and second the low lateral resistance of the, of the reinforced concrete frames. So in this case, the first option should always be to isolate the masonry walls. With this isolation, we will then reduce the, the risk of having short column um, collapse mechanism but then we need to improve the stiffness of the structure. So there are several options for this. For example, you can include some steel bracing as presented in this first um, figure. First, you will do the isolation of the infill walls and then you will stiff the structure with the steel bracing. You can include it in some of these veins in the first and the second um, stories that depends on the particular case story that you are analyzing. You can also do something such as these concrete walls which you will like um, improve one of these um, frames with a, with a wall and this will improve the capacity of the structure. This can be done only in one of the axes or in the other one too. And you can also do something such as include concrete buttresses. For example, if you don't want to make an intervention inside the classrooms or 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 in the front or or back facade then you can do something such as these concrete buttresses but for selecting any of these you first need to understand how much will it cost and the technical and and time also um, by viability of the of the intervention so i'm going to show you the case of the steel bracing this is still bracing uh, as in this in this alternative we are proposing it in the first story this will change the structural system of this building it would wouldn't be a, an rc3 it will become an rc4 and the design level will be also improved so here are the comparison between the two pushovers first you have a pushover that's really vulnerable this is because of the of the um, short column effect, you will have a collapse of the building in here, but with the isolation of the masonry walls and the stiffening of the structure, then you will have a greater capacity in terms of base shear and also in terms of ductility, since you can reach a higher roof displacement. Then you can use those pushover to obtain the EDPs using the ENTO method. These are the original 
um, EDPs that I showed before. These are the new, you can see the difference between them. And you can then derive the fragility function using the LSM method or any other method of your preference, but you will have something like this in which for the original structure, you will have a, a high probability of exceeding a damage state for lower intensity measure levels, while for the retrofitted structure, you can see that all these fragilities uh, slightly move uh, or not slightly move uh, a lot um, here to the right, and then you will have lower probability for lower intensity measures. And then you can convolute them or integrate into, into a vulnerability function to compare that again. And what you will have, for example, is that for 1G of intensity measuring here, we're talking as uh, the spectral in acceleration for the first period or for the first mode, you will have around a damage around 60%. I mean, damage rate around 60%. While for the retrofitting, you can reduce that to around 5% or something like that. Also, you can see that in the original structure, you will almost reach the collapse uh, of the structure when you go to uh, an spectral acceleration of around 2G. While for the retrofitted structure, you will have only damages around 40%. And um, so this is the reinforced concrete case. And I think that with this, we already covered the three case study. Hopefully you will have similar results. And now I will give the word to Rohit um, to moderate any discussion that you that we can have or any question that you that you consider relevant to this cause now. Okay, thank you very much, Rafa. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to pull this. Um, yeah, um, so now we have finished the presentation from outside. So doing the exercise tasks on those three cases, uh, those were inherently different buildings. So you might have some questions or you might have experienced some difficulty running those three different uh, programs, the Excel programs and the MATLAB code. Um, so if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and then ask. Also, you, if you prefer to write the questions in the chat. Yes, 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 please. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Mohammed. Hi. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the UCL team. Uh, I have a question uh, that uh, while uh, selecting the ground motion, mm -hmm. uh, which curve should we select? Uh, is there any idealized curve that we can use for the full building? Um, sorry, what do you mean? For example, there are a lot of curves there. Which curve should we use? Which should which ground motion? Ground motion should we use? Uh, you are talking about the Excel sheet we have given. Yeah, yeah. Is there you, are a lot of curves. For example, uh, okay. Move one one, one second. Give give me one second. I will share the Excel file and then I will explain from there. One moment. Um, for example, this one. Okay. This one. Okay. Okay. Um, can you see the Excel file in the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
at the graphical yeah. into one, one second. Okay. Um, okay. Editing. Okay. Um, the other server. If you have any questions related to this Excel sheet, uh, you can ask um, while I'm on this um, on this part of the uh, exercise. So here you mean? Yeah. Uh, from okay. the selection okay. ground motion. Yeah. So what we have given here is you are supposed to change the blue cells and then here the ground muscles you can change. But what we gave you in the task is that use these 22 ground muscles. You don't have to get new ground muscles. You don't have to modify anything. Okay. So yeah. we are, our competition is done for each ground motion. And each ground muscle is scaled with this, this scale factors here. So for all of this scale factor, and for each of these uh, ground muscles, quantity ground muscles, we are computing the performance points for each and every single ground muscle and is scaled with this scale factor. So here we have given this uh, just so that you can see how uh, your building performs for that particular ground muscle. You can see those here. This is just for illustration. This, oh, okay. th this is just for your illustration. You can you can change this. Uh, so new ground motion, you can change the scale factor. For example, 0 0.5. You are reducing your ground motion by 0 0.5 in acceleration plan. So you can you can see how the performance of your structure changes when you change the ground motion, when you change the scale factor. So this is just for illustration purpose for your. Uh, let's say understanding, but it has nothing to do with which ground motion uh, we are computing for. So we are computing for each and every ground motion and for all these scale factors. So that's clear. So if you click EDP generation here, it it repeats for each ground motion, its scale factor, uh, computes the result for all, all, all cases, and then tests the results here for all different ground motions, all different cases, okay? Is that clear okay. now? Yes, clear, okay, I understand. Okay. okay. And the uh, second question, uh, mm -hmm. what uh, kind of high species loop did you use for this one? Because if we want to do nonlinear analysis, so we should know the uh, relation between displacement and uh, forces. So do you have any idea about that? What's your question, sorry? Uh, what kind of hysteresis, hysteresis loops? Ah, hysteretic loop. Yeah, yeah, because okay, uh, okay, as you know, okay, we, okay, we are yeah. doing a nonlinear analysis. So yes. do you have an idea about that? For example, our further studies. So in, 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 so in our nonlinear analysis, it is pulsover based, okay? This is monotonic pulsover based. We don't have cyclic behavior here. So there is no hysteretic part coming in here. Um, so, but when you model your building, for example, the for RC buildings, when you model your beams, columns, when you model your joints, then you need to model those with nonlinear elements. For example, in uh, last uh, yesterday's lecture, I was showing you the beam column, beam element with concentrated plasticity at two. Years. So that's a nonlinear type of model. Which considers the non-linearity non of your material, for example, the steel, the concrete. So that type of behavior we are including. That's why the name is coming non-linear. But the cyclic part we are not including here. So that's why it is a simplified non-linear analysis method. So the hysteretic part will come into non-linear analysis only, which is sorry, non-linear time history analysis or so similar. It's, uh, so it's just uh, push forward. Just you should. Yes, the, yes. The, the yes. building. Yeah, push the building, but it's not elastic. It's not linear, it's not elastic. Your your material behavior, your structures behavior, the nonlinear uh, behavior is included in your building's model. That's why when you push it even monotonically, you can see the nonlinear response of your building, plastic hinge formation, cracks, the yielding of reinforcements, and so on. So the model is the B linear, yeah, B linear. So then the model is bilinear, yeah? 
Am I right? Uh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they idealize it. After you get the capacity card, on the, yeah. uh, so till you get the push over card, the model is not bilinear. It's it's a card, okay? The, the capacity card right. is a card. It's not bilinear. But when you idealize it while using the entry method, you can use bilinear, perfectly elastic, perfectly plastic, or multilinear or trilinear. There are different uh, different idealizing approaches in literature, in PEMA, or uh, Eurocourse. So, but in particular, uh, this this M2 method we have implemented here, we are using the bilinear, the elastic, perfectly plastic case. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Okay, can we get same push over curve if we perform push over analysis before that? Okay. Yeah, zero and one. Okay. What is this zero and one in blue color for the graphical and two tab? Okay. So in the graphical and two tab, hope you can see the screen. Um, here, this zero and one is, for example, this is about the corner period. That we were talking about in the entry method. In the entry method, or, or if you see the code given response spectra, the design spectra, then there is this this uh, the initial branch, then then plateau, and then the there is parabolic uh, curve going down. So the corner period is that corner where your your SLS and values start decreasing. So that period is very important to decide whether to use the equal displacement tool uh, and so on for the SDF system. So that corner period for each ground motion, as I was saying yesterday, for each ground motion, for example, if you see this blue ground motion here, this one, this can, you can take this as a corner period. For example, you can, you can idealize, you can idealize this, this, um, uh, this, okay. Let me use a pointer way. Okay. So anyway, that, that's the corner period of your ground motion. For for this, for the if you, if you go into the input ground motion Excel sheet, we have computed the corner period for each ground motion one by one by looking at the ground motion set and by using an idealized smooth curve for that ground motion. But also you can that you can implement that automatic calculation of your TC, for example, given here in the graphical M2. So this is just another illustration. It has nothing to do with your results. Okay. So here the scale factor uh, that's already done. So predetermined pre TC is zero case. The TC from this calculation here is another that is called one case. So if you select zero or one here. It, it gets its TC from different cases accordingly. For example, if you select zero here, it takes the TC from the previous sheet, input ground motion sheet. If you consider one here, it takes this value, which is uh, computed from this idealizing here. So um, it, it's up to you to, to check which one TC you want to use and which one looks more appropriate for that particular ground motion. Okay, um, the next question, where is that chart? You answered that already, okay. Okay. Um, so can we get same pushover card if we perform pushover analysis in FEM software, such as STAR or ETAPS or SAP 2000, will the result match? Okay. It depends on which building type you are using, what modeling, uh, options or modeling approaches you are using. There are finite element approaches, discrete element approaches. Uh, for example, the one we were using for masonry is applied element approach. So I don't, I can't say, I don't think it it matches like um, well. There will be some discrepancy, of course, depending on the methods, assumptions, and so on. And and also um, the stars, the caps or SAP. They are very good programs for linear elastic analysis. Okay, linear elastic analysis of the structures, SAP 2000, EDAPS, those FEM based software are very good. But for nonlinear analysis, 
For example, the earthquake flooring, especially on masonry buildings, the behavior of masonry is highly nonlinear, even for small level of displacement. So, so these programs will not yield reliable results yet. That's what I can say. But for reinforced concrete, uh, where you can you can assume your elements are continuous, and then you can your elastic nonlinear uh, modeling um, still applies quite well. Yes, Rohita, just to complement that, yeah. under, for, for uh, RC, for example, it depends, of course, on the type of nonlinearity that you are considering. For example, if you want to model based on hinges in the ends of each element, I think that one of these soft softwares will relatively work well for, for one to obtain this pushover. When you are talking or when your objective is to make a nonlinear dynamic analysis, maybe you should move to another type of, of software and also if you want to model it with fibers uh, it will be also different but of course it depends a lot on the considerations and the characteristics that you yes exactly the modeling to model yeah. exactly and there, there are other options for example the open sys which is open source traction okay. for for uh, seismic modeling and analysis of uh, or, or even in the computer and structures like house of softwares, they have performed yeah, treaty, perform which treaty, is yeah. more suitable for nonlinear analysis. Yes, and there is seismic stuff in the euro uh, that's also widely used by researchers or even practitioners. You can get a student license of uh, seismic stuff, it's very good software. Okay, after retrofitting of the buildings, uh, which building index or parameters do you change in which you get better result in terms of capacity? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in, in the onion push masonry case, um, we used uh, the ring band strengthening for the whole building. That's what we call global retrofitting, global level of strengthening uh, to, to improve the capacity code. There are sometimes local level of strengthening. For example, you can, you can strengthen a particular wall or for reinforced concrete building, you can strengthen particular columns, one or two columns. So those are local level of uh, interventions which could uh, provide some level of strengthening, uh, some level of improvement in the capacity code, but not very much. But the, the strengthening methods we adopted here are global strengthening, for example, even for reinforced concrete buildings. So in my case, in the unreinforced masonry case, we changed the seismic design level, of course. It was low design before. After the retrofitting, it became high design, sorry, medium design. Um, and apart from that, from the original condition, the building went into retrofitted condition. But Apart from that, there are no changes, no modifications in the in the taxonomy of the index building. For example, for RC building, maybe Rafa, you can say something. Rafael? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm going to share very fast also my screen. Yeah, please. Um, just to show this uh, slide, for example, in this case, it, the original building was an RC tree. So when you Stephen in here with uh, concrete walls or with these steel uh, diagonals or with any type of uh, stiffening method and you isolate the walls then you will not be generating the short column effect so therefore you won't have now an rc3 building so the correct new taxonomic classification will be changing that first structural system for an rc4 then you should also change the design level because it's no longer a low design level now you have a more engineering building and it depends on, on the type of retrofittings that you are doing. For example, if you retrofit also the foundations and at the beginning you have a flexible foundation condition, then you will change it to a rigid foundation condition. Or for example, another important parameter is this last one that refers if, if to the structure was retrofitted or not in the past. So in the original, taxonomy we had original structure as the parameter in here now we should change it to retrofit this structure because this is not a building that was originally designed as it is now it was originally designed different 
and with an intervention, we manage to change the conditions and the vulnerability. So it is important to have that trace of, of what had been yes. done to the building, and therefore mm -hmm. you should also change in here. So at the end, you will have a totally different index buildings. And this is also shown in here, the retrofitting, the vulnerability function will be completely different too. And you can assign this to a particular taxonomy and an index building with an RC3 building with mid rise and low design level, while this should be assigned to a RC4 mid a rise and mid design level or high design level, depending on, on how you manage to do the retrofitting. And this will be used then in a, or can be used then in a probabilistic risk assessment in which you can analyze the original condition and how the risk level and the risk losses and all the risk metrics are using the original structures. And then you can change the vulnerability functions for the retrofitted ones to see how the risk will be reduced and you can therefore identify the gap of the of the reducing of the risk and you can use that as the benefits of implementing and retrofitting so you can compare that then with the cost of doing the retrofitting to do a for example a benefit cost analysis to see if retrofitting a building or is is cost efficient or or not yep. um, thank you Rafa Okay. Um, um, uh, I can elaborate more about the role of generating hinges while running to server analysis. In software like SAP 2000 or ETAPS, we don't usually assign hinges while analyzing designing RC frame buildings. Rafael, yes, do you want to? Yeah? Yes, thank you, Rohit. And this is connected with what Rohit was explaining at the beginning. When when we use this type of softwares for designing of, of the buildings, you usually stay in the linear phase of the of the of the behavior, like the linear and elastic uh, part of the behavior of the seismic behavior of the building. So therefore, there's no need to include any hinge, and you are considering indirectly, uh, like all those. Um, characteristics with the R factor and the different design procedures that are applicable in each one of the countries. So for designing in general and for some vulnerability analysis when you want, for example, to calculate the overstresses in one element, then you can use um, one of these softwares and stay in the linear and elastic part of the, of the behavior and that will be perfect and there's no need to include any hinge. But if you want to produce a pushover curve, then you need to model the structure and model how the structure will behave also in the plastic and just um, uh, before the collapse point. So therefore you need to include the nonlinearity in some way. And usually what you do in reinforced concrete building is to in model the nonlinearity as a punctual nonlinearity in the hinge. So you will include a particular a hinge condition in the extreme um, part of each one of the elements where the plasticity, you, where you expect the plasticity to occur. And that's a concentrated plasticity modeling approach. Um, and that can be done using sub 2000. This can be done using Perform 2D and also using the tabs. Uh, and there's other type of nonlinearity that should that can be also considered that is a distributed nonlinearity that is modeling each element with fibers. And I am not sure. I think that you can also do that in some of this software, but I haven't done it myself for that type of nonlinearity. Uh, what is recommended is to use other type of softwares such as a perform 3D or open seas, or if you want to go and model in more detail, then you can use a, a, a other type of more specific software such as ANSYS or, or Abacus. And these for RC buildings and, and, and that's how you usually use it. I, I don't know if I answered your question, Aline, or, or if you want to open your mic and um, describe more the question. Okay, I think that we... 
point. Good, okay. perfect. Um, okay. A, what kind of nonlinearity is used in the Hanson task? So for, for masonry, we didn't use the FEM process. We use the applied element method where we model each of the bricks individually. So it's 11 by 11 procedure. The, the bricks are considered rigid elements which are connected by mortar. So all the nonlinearity occurs in mortar. So the mortar's nonlinear properties are taken uh, to be similar to that of the RC. So it's the compressive, the tensile, and the shear model for RC stacking. For reinforced concrete, um, I think Raphael used the Pohon 3D. No, in, in this pushover that we gave in here, we use OpenSys. And OpenSys, the, yeah. The, yes, and, and we use a distributed plasticity, so a fiber model in, in OpenSys. Yeah. But but in, in, in our examples, in our uh, sessions, we didn't uh, give you the details of what background push our procedure we follow. We just wanted to uh, provide you the final result of push our curves and then wanted you to practice more on the entry method, the seismic performance assessment, facility and volatility derivation. Exactly. And the election of one method to use, it depends a lot on the characteristics of your project and your own capacities. For example, the, the, the fiber model is very good if you want to obtain one of these pushover curves because it is relatively easy to obtain and fast. If you want to do nonlinear dynamic analysis, this means to take each one of the ground motions and run it like as a, as a time history analysis, maybe it will take too much time and it will be better to use a concentrated plasticity. In model. So it depends a lot on your capacities and also the capacities of the computer that you are using and the final objective of the modeling. If you want only a pushover or if you want to do a more detailed um, analysis. Yeah. Um, and also to add to that, uh, we will have more courses uh, coming in the future uh, that will deal with specifics of masonry modeling and how to conduct pushover analysis using uh, different modeling approaches uh, uh, and similarly for RC buildings. So those detailed technical courses on pushover analysis, the nonlinear modeling of buildings will, will come into future sessions. So you need to keep an eye on our website and the course study. Any more questions? We still have time. So uh, you, so did you experience any difficulty in installing the MATLAB uh, code or do you have any questions on the facility to vulnerability derivation using the Excel sheet? Any confusion, any questions? or even feedbacks for our courses. Mm -hmm. So if- And also Roy, yeah. um, just one thing, I'm going to share you a um, link uh, in the chat so you can feel a sorbi. Uh, about that precisely this is anonymous and you can say what do you think that we should improve what do you like about the course if you are in capacity now to develop your own uh, fragility and vulnerability curves the idea is that you can give us some feedback so we can improve the the future courses that we give under the unesco chair umbrella yeah so uh Perfect. Yes, I, I just send it in the chat. So just click it. Yes. You will take around one minute to fill and it will be yes. very helpful for us. So thank you. That will be we will send this by email later to all, but, but it will be great if you can start helping us with this. Okay. So um, if there are no more questions, uh, we would Sorry. like to 
Yep. I have uh, the, for example, if I'm opening the uh, MATLAB code, uh, that uh, there is the error, XL is uh, read unable to open file LS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this means that my file should be also the, on the desktop, yeah? In the same place with the MATLAB coded file? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It should be in the same place. It already installs in the same place. It's already there. So, okay, because sometimes I'm getting the error. Uh, what's the error? Can you read it again? Unable to open file LSM mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cell file. And then it says read only file? Yeah. The yeah, Excel okay. file, I cannot read. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is when you go to uh, provide your inputs into that LSM Excel file, after you do the input, you need to close it. You cannot keep it uh, open. You need to close oh. it because when you run the MATLAB code, it goes to write into that LSM file. So if you have already it open, then the, the, the MATLAB code, it cannot write into that file. So you need to, oh. after you give your inputs, you need to close it and then run the MATLAB code, wait until it finishes the run. Then after it says it's safe to go back to open the Excel file, then you can open the Excel file and see your results. Uh, okay, 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 understand. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, with this, we are now coming to the end of this session. Uh, we want to thank each and uh, everyone uh, who participated and uh, uh, got engaged into the exercise. And we hope to uh, have you. In, in our future courses as well. So keep an eye on our um, on our website, the UNESCO chair website, uh, it's here. If you search UNESCO chair at UCL, you will easily find the website. Um, and these are the list of courses that are planned for, for, for uh, future. So the next course, for example, is the Loss modeling framework, which is useful in insurance and reinsurance industry. Uh, we, we, the upcoming courses uh, about system resilience, decision making framework using the ACN network. There is a structural resilience course, which will focus on reinforced concrete buildings, the modeling, nonlinear modeling, the numerical analysis, and the pushover analysis. So, those technical details will come into that course. Similarly, for masonry. Uh, and the as in best modeling and neural network. So keep an eye on our website. We will be advertising these courses in, in, in the near future. Uh, and we have Professor Bina Dayala now joined. So she can uh, uh, say some words at closing remark. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rohit. I think that you have already uh, covered all the relevant uh, uh, information. I hope that everybody has uh, been uh, enjoying the uh, activity and uh, has found it useful and you know stimulating. Um, we will soon add on our website a list of uh, also uh, resources that are not just the lectures but you know some more uh, papers and documents that you can. Uh, download and uh, study in your own time. Um, we would also uh, like to hear quite detailed feedback from you on your specific interest as we go forward in developing new uh, courses. So I think you will receive from the chair a request for a, um, a short uh, survey form, um, which we hope you will engage with, because of course, it's the best way to uh, improve our offer uh, to listen to what uh, are your uh, requests. Um, we look very much forward to see you quite soon in a month or a month and a half um, on this same channel. And thank you again for participating. Um, and hopefully you will have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Bye everyone.
We hope to see Bye you. Bye, everyone. Bye.